Well, let's start with when did you start in the was fire department your your first fire department? Yes, 1977. I joined the FDNY. So tell me about uh, tell me about recruitment school and uh, tell me about what we taught about uh, nozzle operations or nozzles, nozzles and streams at that point. You remember, <clears throat> like roughly? Yes. Uh, there was let's say very little. Uh, education or training with respect to fire dynamics. I mean, yeah. granted, we were uh, uh, being exposed to uh, the, the fire triangle. I don't believe I was introduced to the tetrahedron, you know, uninhibited chain reaction yeah. uh, at that time. So, of course, we were being um, uh, educated at uh, water uh, suppressors by cooling. Uh, there was no mention of uh, generation of steam and the efficiency of steam. That would come years later, my understanding, with respect to uh, uh, learning a little bit more about fog nozzles and why and how they came about uh, and their use for shipboard firefighting. Uh, but yet it was really just learning the skills and techniques of uh, hand lines. Uh, the pressures that they would be pumped at, what we expected uh, to deliver with, uh, you know, gallons per minute out of those nozzles for the efficiency. Uh, water damage was never a discussion, you know, using too much water. Uh, it was during what we refer to as our war years, war years meaning that there was a, trend, a tremendous amount of fire activity uh, in the city. Uh, you might say it was in the ghetto, but uh, even more so, much of it was uh, arson for profit. Uh, people were purchasing buildings that were in decay, and they were uh, insuring them for you know large amounts of money. And they themselves were hiring arsonists to one set fires in the buildings. And some of these buildings were not vacant; they were occupied with people. And the arsonist was so, uh, let's say, keen with an understanding that if they burnt the roof off the building, the building would be considered a total loss. So the people that owned the building would create, uh, would collect the most amount of money for, you know, a total loss of the building. So yeah. they would set the fires on the top floor so that it got into the cock loft, but they would set the fires on the top floor in the rear of the building where we couldn't uh, hit it with master streams and things like that. In other words, make our job that much more difficult to ensure that the fires... Uh, you know, gain proportions. Yeah. Uh, so, and then, they, of course, there was a lot of vacant buildings. So, there was a lot of fire duty. And water damage was not even a uh, discussion. Uh, it was, you know, the efficiency of fast water on the fire. Uh, pulling up to a building, engine on a hydrant, truck in front of the building for its ladder, and the efficiency of stretching hose lines. Uh, and, and you know what? We're going to a lot of fires and we're having a lot of fun. Tell you the truth. Yeah, well, I, I can't deny that going to fires is fun. <laughs> it is. Firefighting is fun. It's it's uh, challenging. It's like uh, it's always a new puzzle to solve. Um, yeah. So go, going back to going back to the recruit school. So you say you were taught um, like the fire triangle, maybe not, not necessarily. Do you know where the tetrahedron got into play? You know, it, did it make any difference? We were not, you know, we were, let's say, told with respect to uh, dry chemical uh, extinguishers and things like that. Uh, it, it really wasn't explained very well as to how dry chem uh, extinguishes fires. You know, it doesn't absorb heat. It doesn't exclude oxygen. Uh, so the portion of the uninhibited chain reaction for me i guess as a young firefighter i didn't understand that until i myself started getting involved into wanting to learn more about my job and then i started reading the books uh, but it, it, it may have been mentioned in recruit school but i don't know that it made such an impression that once i left recruit school wow i had this uh, you know profound <laughs> understanding fire dynamics and how it works uh tell you the truth and i was yeah, 30 we, we, years yeah. old so i wasn't a young firefighter i mean a young man where you know all of this was foreign language to me oh yeah 
did you have did you have any uh, like um, high school background college background or uh very little college background uh and of course i had been in the united states navy and i was part of uh, a damage control team and what a damage control team is um if a, a ship should incur a, a collision or something like that or a fire uh, this team would be activated on board ship with stretch hand lines and things like that. And I wasn't a nozzle man, but what I was, uh, was a communicator. I was at the fire, uh, let's say area, uh, point of operations with sound powered phones. And I was communicating to the bridge, uh, notifying, uh, the officer, you know, the captain or who, who was ever in charge, notifying them of the progress of conditions that was going on. That was my job. What? Yeah, l let's get back to the Navy. That's interesting because I didn't uh, fog nozzle and, and uh, that story. Um, let's go back to so starting at. Do you remember from from like first school? Uh, but nozzle technique was it? I mean, in, in America you got the O pattern and Z pattern and uh, lying eight and so so on. Uh, do you know like in in terms of that regard, like was there any teaching into how to actually move your nozzle? Yes, uh, in a clockwise fashion, and uh, coming into a room, let's say that's fully involved, whip it around, meaning hit the walls, hit the ceiling, and hit the even hit the floor, uh, it, especially going down hallways. And the reason for hitting the floor was cooling it down, but in some vacant buildings, there was so much drug activity going on that uh, there may be uh, syringes and things like that, needles on the floor. We wanted to wash them away. Uh, but also, I mean, going down a hot hallway, uh, the water, you know, that runs down off the walls is very hot. And for the most part, a lot of firefighters are on their knees. My technique, when I was a nozzle man, I wanted to duck walk, if you will. I want it to be on both my legs, and if I leaned over or something, my knee would only come in contact with the, the floor momentarily. In other words, I was not crawling in on my knees and working that nozzle. And if I was to teach, if you will, uh, hose technique, I didn't want firefighters on their knees. To me, it's too slow. So, so, and uh, we'll, we can get, get back to that one. So, so, was there any going back again to recruit school? Do you know if there was any talk about like when did you start to apply water back in the day? So when did you actually open your nozzle? Do not do not operate water into smoke. When you see fire, then operate the line. That was the, that was the teaching. Yes. Do you know, exactly. I know how long how long has that been in place before that? Was it you know if that was well into the eighties. Yeah, but, but before that, you know, where you like, how long would you go back and, you know, how would that have been taught in the 40s, 50s, 60s? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so when you, when I look at Lloyd Lehman and, and uh, the Royal Nelson and, and those people that died, did the, at the Ivy State University, they did the videos, like the Nosselman and so on. Yes. Uh, was that video or the teachings from that just talked about that video? Was that something that was used in FDNY? Was it no. known about? Was it? It had to be known about, but only by a few individuals. And, and I'll go back to a comment that I made uh, in our last conversation. Uh, my analogy of FDNY was that we were living in a cave and we were in, enjoying our own cave art and we really didn't get close to the uh, opening to the cave to understand that there was a world outside. There was really only a handful of individuals uh, in a department as large as FDNY that were looking uh, outside the cave or outside the department and being exposed to those things. And that was people like Bill Clark who had written a book, uh, Firefighter Practice and Principles, uh, Freed, there was another gentleman by the name of Freed. Um, <clears throat> and as I say, it was very few individuals. And again, we had also had the conversation that, you know, persons, and I had experienced myself, 
trying to introduce things into a large department uh, that we were learning uh, from the outside and wanted to introduce it into a, a large department to maybe change a policy, a procedure, uh, or a technique. Uh, <laughs> was not going to happen. Be, oh, if you if that's your idea, oh, let's go with it. No, it's not going to happen. So you almost had to come up with uh, ways to convince. And my, you know, certainly my um, uh, tactic was to uh, form partnerships with NIST, National Institute of Standard and Technology, uh, and other departments: Chicago, Toledo, uh, Ottawa, uh, Peter McBride and his department. They had done some work uh, as well, you know, in areas. So to say, yeah, there was information out there, uh, but really very few people were looking at it. Because uh, like in, in, in those early publications from Iowa State University, they talk about the topics like steam clouds, like how important it is to have a steam cloud above your head. Because if you maintain that steam, no, sorry, steam blanket is the word they used. If you maintain that steam blanket high up, you'll suppress fire, uh, basically. So they talk about, say, for instance, a steam blanket. Was there something that was sure. ever... I never heard that term, but I, what I have heard and, and what was uh, you know bantered about was the thermal balance. Yeah. Uh, now, a steam blanket, I've never really seen, a, meaning where steam would come down to a certain level uh, and then it would be clear below. Because once you introduce water into you know a, a, a room fully involved uh it it creates and i've used the term Feynman soup the entire space uh, <laughs> everything becomes, gets everywhere <laughs> right the entire space turns into steam and i associated that with you know again uh pulses of water into the mm. ceiling and around and when i came upon uh what was either a fully room involved or the source of fire then we would direct our water directly onto it. Uh, or a room fully involved, we'll just whip it around now. We have no choice. We're going to make uh, uh, Feynman soup, and it's all going to be steam, and we're going to move in and, you know, get to uh, what is the main body of fire. So I think that one of the problem is that in the United States, and this is this is very common in Europe too, is that uh, how you define steam. So steam is invisible. What you see the white stuff, like when you get started fireman soup, is condensing steam back to water droplets, which happens right. at 212 degrees and below. Right. So what, 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 what? For instance, they say in in, in the the videos that Osselman and so on is that you want to maintain the steam blanket, meaning basically uh, invisible steam, because steam rises. It's like that's right. where you have clouds in the air. Uh, steam rises. But you don't want to condense the steam by over applying water because if you over apply water, you condense it back to water droplets and water droplets will go everywhere and turn into the fire, firefighter soup. You know, and quite frankly, the American Fire Service didn't understand that concept because we all use too much water. Yeah, but it's it's still interesting because it's it originates. That's what that's that's one of the reasons why 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 the Europeans, the, well, the steam, Matro Sanders, and Christy Giesesen start thinking about steam as a suppressant, right. like how to use that more efficiently. For instance, with the fog, to, because with the fog, the objective is basically to create that steam blanket. You just need enough water up into the to the atmosphere so that this forms steam but it doesn't condense into water droplets so that the steam goes everywhere. Well, They're basically the, steam and water droplets in that case. And I, I understand. And, and, and that's the main reason why uh, the New York City Fire Department, uh, and, and of course I forgot to mention a name by the name of uh, John O'Hagan. John O'Hagan was uh, the chief of our department and he also went on to become the commissioner of our department. And he was uh, the influence that introduced fog nozzles into the FDNY, and they were introduced in the 70s. Uh, they were introduced along with a water additive referred to as rapid water, uh, and that water additive, what its main function and its purpose was to reduce uh, the turbulence of water in inch and three quarter lines, the smaller uh, attack lines, so that the water delivery would be equal to that of two and a half inch lines. Uh, but it was 
in the 1960s, that inch and three quarter line was introduced into the FDN one. Before that, everything was fought with two and a half. But they were introduced for the mobility of fighting fires in ordinary construction, tenements, apartment houses, and things like that, for which the activity was exploding. A uh, tremendous amount of work. So they wanted to make it uh, somewhat easier on the forces line that was, let's say, more manageable. But with the introduction of these fog nozzles, uh, again, was with what we referred to as slippery water. It was a water additive. But coincidentally, it was at a, a period where the financial situation of the city of New York was in decay, in decline. So that being said, there was cutbacks with all the city services and things like that. And the FDNY experienced a cutback, whereas thousands of firefighters were laid off their jobs. So that being said, with this introduction of this fog nozzle, slippery water, and layoffs, the fire department, the members of the fire department equated that nozzle that you introduced, replaced a firefighter on the back step. But now let's move up to, we were not explained or educated on the efficiency of how that nozzle was supposed to work. In other words, we probably should have been taught the methods of, you know, 3D firefighting, gas cooling and all of that. None of that was mentioned. It was just, here's a nozzle. Try this. Uh, it's it's going to be new. It's going to work well for you. And it didn't because I had mentioned in our last conversation. Also, when we had inappropriate ventilation or no ventilation, firefighters were getting burned and steamed because these gases weren't being pushed anywhere. Uh, you know, uh, so as I said, those nozzles are still in service. We still have them on the apparatus, but they're not our first line of choice. It's now we went back to smooth them. And it's because we really weren't educated on the efficiency of these nozzles and how to use them. So when you were in the Navy, uh, when you were in the Navy, so you said you wanted the nozzle man, but do you know that they were using fog nozzles in shipboard firefighting? They were not. They had a, a, a type of nozzle that it was three position. It, it could give you a straight stream or it could give you the mist, uh, you know, and this was yeah. a... Uh, I forget what the, the name of that nozzle was. And or they had the very long fog type nozzles that were supposed to uh, afford you protection and, and put a spray over oh, the Oh, the one that we walked up below? Yeah. Oh, my oh, God. wow. Yeah. And I didn't even, okay. you could I didn't even know those were used. Right. You could open up a hatch and stick it in if the radiant heat was so much. You could, you know, yeah. heat long, you could stick it in. But uh, for the most part, uh, even our attack team, we did not use that uh, nozzle on mist. We, we used it on straight stream. If, uh, you know, we had few fires on the ship, not many. Uh, now it was used in the straight stream uh, position. But uh, I guess it was Lloyd Lehman that came up with the mist. So that's why that nozzle had two positions. Yeah, I mean, uh, I would, well, at least Lloyd Lehman was the one who published it and made it made it known i don't know if he was the actual i mean there were fog nozzles before that but but at least it was him he that that wrote about it made it publicly known and 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 put it into context i think but anyway so lloyd layman we talked about it and there was a more more efficient absorbing energy and i mean in that case it was the the navy studies back in the 40s i think or 50s or something like that um where they recognized also that in, in, in concealed compartments and, and closed compartments, if you, if you could vaporize it to steam, it, it would suppress the fire with right. the consequence of if, you, if you're in there yourself, <laughs> tough and luck. that was the point. It was a closed apartment, a yeah. compartment, if you will. But then you also mentioned Royer uh, Nelson, right? Uh, yeah, and, and Bill, what it's called, I don't know what's, what's the other guy's names. Yeah, I know. I was trying to think of myself, but they had uh, acquired uh, at Iowa State University, anyway. Correct, and they spoke of uh, the indirect attack and the combination attack. And the indirect attack was basically what Lloyd Lehman was doing: was introduce uh, water in the form of a uh, mist that would turn to steam, and there was no ventilation at all, and you'd close the door. Whereas the combination attack was to really just extend the nozzle into the space 
maybe a few feet and whip it around, trying to, uh, I believe how I interpret it, was to make more steam because of the water uh, hitting uh, the hot surfaces of walls and ceiling. But still, it was an underventilated space. Nobody was entering the space, per se. Um, but I think America, they, I, they did. If you look at the videos, and I've looked at it for some time ago, I looked at it extensively just to understand. They weren't very good at explaining um, some of the terminology. But they did talk about, and I think there was that, that they talked about the indirect attack, and, and but they also talked about the indirect effect of an attack. Okay. So, and, the, and I think that, that played part in, in a lot of confusion because the indirect attack they're talking about was actually placing uh, uh, small amounts of, of, of water and creating in, in the atmosphere, basically gas cooling and creating creating that steam blanket which is basically mostly common what, what we in Europe would then call gas cooling. Right. But they also talk about the indirect effect. And the indirect effect was when you, like you said, when you, when you get water on the surface and that vaporizes to steam, the steam follows wherever the flows are. Maybe it's you know, up into the, the, the top of the compartment, but it could also be into another compartment or up into the attic. And that indirect effect would be the steam suppressing the fire along with that, that flow path. Uh, and that's what they would call the indirect effect. And they, they did like an example of that they suppressed a room and content fire with which extended up into the attic. And if you did that w without over applying water, because they, they talk about the risk of over applying water. So they talk about if you if you use just moderate amounts of, of water in that in the room and content fire, you would vaporize enough water to steam so that it will follow the flow path up into the attic and suppress the attic fire. Exactly. Instead of instead of over applying water on that on that floor so that not so that very little turns to steam and there's no indirect effect up into the attic. Now that's interesting. Uh, because I, I, I've never heard it explained that way. And that certainly would have <clears throat> broadened uh, understanding. But yet, <clears throat> you know, our um, uh, policy and tactics are to provide, let's say, uh, vertical ventilation uh, as soon as possible. And if it was known that fire was in the attic and or we call uh, certain, some of those spaces cock loft, because it's, it's, it's a small yeah, it's space. Yeah, it's a small space, yeah. In other words, like top floor fires, uh, we would have firefighters up there trying to place a hole in the roof, if you will. And that would negate the, the efficiency of the steam because what that would wind up doing was if there was a fire in the cock loft, would only be uh, providing it more oxygen. Yeah, and letting steam out. And also unburned um, um, products of combustion. Like when fire burns, it produces a lot of stuff that it can't burn again. <laughs> Like if that's removed, you have to get, you have to have two things. Like you have to get a fire. You have to, like, if you're talking, especially under ventilated fires or, or oxygen limited fires, you have to do two things. You can't just add oxygen. You also have to remove stuff that can't burn <coughs> hmm. because they worked as, as, as a thermal ballast. They, 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 they want to steal energy away from the fire basically so so you have to remove that so if you, if you let's say you have a peaked roof and you have a fire in here and you ventilate that space what you do is you you take something away which is which is products of combustion to start with and that leaves you with enough basic vacuum to get oxygen in and now you get a mixture to burn again so you're doing two things which i would consider to be very negative for an attic fire when you put, pop a hole in the roof now there is there's a, like we're jumping jumping questions here, but there is one aspect of of of, of vertical ventilation that is not talked about, uh, because in Europe and it, it's a lot of bashing of vertical <laughs> ventilation, uh, and and but there is one aspect I've never heard about it in uh, United States either. I never heard about it in the U.S. studies to talk about it. It's uh, when you have. Let's say you have a fire here in a single dwelling and you have a flow path, bi-directional air track going back and forth to like the door. And if you if you start ventilating that fire, 
by breaking windows horizontally, you're going to create those bi-directional air tracks where you have oxygen coming in and, and smoke coming out and there's mixing. Everywhere you get bi-directional air track, you get mixing and turbulence. And then you get prob probably or eventually uh, you will get a flammable mixture in there. But when you do vertical ventilation, you, you, you maintain the stratosphere. So the optimal vertical ventilation, which is easiest in the big building, is when you have you have a, a smoke layer or, or maybe it's all the way down to the ground. But it, when you do that vertical ventilation, the, what goes up out into the hole is just non, uh, well, it's, it's fuel. It's maybe, maybe fuel, <laughs> maybe combustible. But mm -hmm. when the oxygen comes in, it goes in below. So there is this stratosphere going on. There's no turbulence in, in the perfect world. There's no turbulence, Understood. meaning that you will have a boundary layer here, maybe where some oxygen comes in, a little bit of combustion, but most of it is just too rich to burn up here. It's it's boundary layer here, and it's too little fuel down here. So you create a lot less turbulence, which creates a lot less fire, which creates a lot more more efficient ventilation process. And that aspect of vertical ventilation is not talked about in in in, in great detail, which is a again. And that's what uh, we experience, and that's why. We We've been performing it, and that's why, uh, m you know, much of the pushback that uh, we're talking about today with educating uh, fire dynamics, we're getting pushback because <clears throat> uh, much of our department over the years has experienced, hey, once you, you know, provide vertical ventilation, whether it be opening a, a door uh, to the interior stairs, meaning ordinary construction, yeah. a high rise. Uh, it just starts to lift, or if you have a fire in a strip mall and it's a single-story uh, building, uh, and you put a hole directly over the fire, everything goes right to that hole. There, there's no turbulence, boom. And sometimes opening that hole, uh, the smoke will come out, and it'll ignite a foot or two above the roof. Yeah. It's just coming out of thick black smoke, and then it lights up because now, uh, it, of course, as you said, it was too rich to burn. Now it's uh, reaching that point. But it just makes <clears> the <throat> efficiency of extinguishing the fire so much easier in that now all of a sudden they can get to see where they're walking, where they're turning, where the fire is, because it's just lifting. Uh, so, I mean, that's the perfect world for us. That's what we like. And it, and it is. The, the, the problem, of course, is that when you don't, when you don't have... When you expect that outcome every fire, exactly, and, and and you don't have the skills or the ability, practical ability to judge when is that not going to be the case, when I'm going to break that roof and everything turns into a jet engine and I'll kill everyone inside, like that. That that's of course. So so the, I that's I think that's the problem with most ventilation studies, over ventilation practices that they they work generally if you go where, wherever you go in the world by ventilation, you go to Sweden, generally they work 95% of the time. <laughs> the problem is we don't identify we don't identify the 5% is going to be a problem. We don't under, identify the 1% that somebody's going to get killed. Well, nice. so, yeah. so that I think that's been the problem and, and that is that is reinforced every bread and butter fire that well just just do that ventilation cut and everything gets better when i first started uh, let's say studying for promotion and uh let's say my enthusiasm was building on i want to learn more because i was uh assigned and working uh, in a ladder company a truck company in brooklyn and uh, it was an active company when i left my house to drive to work i knew that night or that day i'd be going to a structural fire uh, that was exciting. It was great. Uh, we pull up to a fire, and it's in a, uh, a single-story building, commercial building. It may have been 100 deep uh, by about 25 wide. And <clears throat> glass front window and a set of glass doors, a, a double door that would open like this, that led into a hallway that, as you go down that hallway, wide hallway, uh, to your left was individual um, businesses, if you will, uh, who's selling jewelry, who's selling, the, in other words, almost like a, a small mall, if you will. Small mall, yeah. Okay, but it, it was a small building. And the fire uh, wasn't sure exactly where it was. Well, it wasn't in the front. Uh, you know, we had smoke 
The windows were not hot, uh, so it could have been in the middle or, or the rear. And as soon as we, uh, let's say, uh, compromised the lock where I could open the door, as soon as we, and I was the first to truck, as soon as we opened up the door, we could see that wind was being brought in. In other words, it was sucking in. And I closed the door and I said to the officer, we need a hole in this roof first. And where I'm coming from is I had already read what are the warning signs for a backdraft. And if it's sucking air in, to me, that was not a good sign. So based upon that, the officer said, okay. And we radioed to the roof firefighter, give us a hole as soon as possible. And uh, the deputy chief arrived as well. And he said, why aren't you guys moving in? And I opened up the door, and he saw the smoke being sucked in. He goes, okay, and he understood. <laughs> and as soon as we had a hole in the roof, then we opened it up, and basically the place did not light up on us, meaning all of that smoke over our head or explode, but it allowed us to operate the hand lines going in, you know? <clears throat> so and I and believe I, ventilation. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think that, I mean, they go to, like when, when, oh, but when, Past the pressure attack was introduced in Sweden or in the late 90s, like using a fan really aggressively, which is like the, I would call it the European version of aggressive. We talked about it last time. I don't like the yes, word aggressive, yes, but, <laughs> but very, uh, very active, in other words, um, use, of, uh, use of like some ventilation, like very before you get water on the fire and so on. There's a reason, I mean, the one of the reasons why Sweden is not very big on vertical ventilation is just roof construction. It's take like forever to cut a hole in the roof. You're like, you're done firefighting before you cut a hole in the roof. So I think this, uh -huh. this, the, 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 it's because of weather and so on, because of insulation and so on. It, it's, it's just harder. Okay. But, but so it's just a happen chance that that might be. But, but going back to it again. There's so many stories and so much experience of positive pressure attack that says, well, it's, it's awesome. It works beautifully until it fails spectacularly <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and like and, and it goes back to that one and identifying and to me it was like well so the ul studies and so on they all kind of confirmed that in, in those type of residencies uh, there are very few occasions you see a a, a, a a very big advantage of doing ventilation whatever ventilation might be in those small spaces because you don't get you you don't get visibility that fast you don't get uh, or even at all back and you and you, the fire starts to pick off and the temperature increases and the rates of toxic gases increases and so on and that is, is put into contrast with all the 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 stories that you hear all the experience says well it, that doesn't seem that that doesn't rhyme with me because i've seen something else in real life um and, and 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 so so you have I don't know if you have a you have a clash between experience and science. Would you say that that's would you say that that's true? <laughs> uh, Very much so, and it uh, it frustrates me because some of um, the clash and experience uh, here in the United States with people of influence, if you will, in the industry uh, are people that to me are closed-minded about the science they're not even reading the reports uh they're just saying hey you know what i've been to thirty thousand fires uh things like that you have to be open-minded i mean uh, what are we discussing meaning with the science uh, what are they saying and if you have uh, an, an opposition and i don't believe ul is saying these are the techniques they're saying these are the outcomes, and uh, if you do this, you know, it's going to change uh, temperature or whatever. I mean, the whole thing about pushing fire. Uh, yeah. I'm sure you've read some <laughs> of the stuff about yeah. it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've heard it mentioned. <laughs> I mean, if you just break it down into, okay, if you operate a line into uh, an opening, if you will, yeah. you're negating that opening to be a vent point. Yeah. Or it's possible. However, yeah. if you operate the line in a, in a pattern or if it's a fog not, fog pattern or whatever, okay, so the fire is going to seek another vent point, period. Yeah. And, and it's just going to travel to that vent point. I mean, it's as simple as that. Yeah, it is simple, but it's, it's it is still is complicated. And, and firefighters haven't been thinking about 
fire in terms of inlets and outlets and flow paths for if you talk it broadly and generally have firefighters have you been talking about that for until the last 10 years uh in europe maybe 15 20 years uh so so it's not a new thing to talk about like fire goes to high pressure uh, sorry fire goes from high pressure to low pressure like that's right. uh that's not that's not something firefighters talk about they used to go like far, they fire go. they are now well they should be now at, at least but going going back to like ventilation i think it i think it's interesting that there's when this 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 clash between science and and and, and experience i think that one of the uh, uh, problems with that is of is that uh, when you did the science in that case, the, the, you always let the fire go to, you light a fire in the couch and you let it go to basically, almost all the studies, you let it go to basically decay and let it go to decay for some period of time. And then you open door, window, whatever it might be. It's the same scenario pretty much all the time. And you have to do that because you can get consistency of the fires and so on. But yes. in the real life, you go to fires and some of them are really small to begin with. They can be small for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, depending on where they actually start to burn in the house. Like now, in your study, it's, it's, all, it's always in like a corner in a sofa and the sofa is fairly combustible. So the, and so the, the, the rate of fire to start off is pretty fast. And in real fires, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you just go to those earlier incipient fires or half incipient fires. You always go to decay fires that decay even more. So there's, there's the, the, the temperature has gone down way more than that also. And in both those scenarios, the ventilation is going to work perfectly because it doesn't really matter if you mix probably really cold, cold smoke, but highly, a lot of fuel in it. But if you mix really cold smoke, it's not going to be prone to ignition for most of the case. Or if mm. it's very incipient, it can be a lot of smoke maybe, but, but it, it, it's not flammable because again, there's, there's, it's not enough temperature. It's not enough fuel in the smoke probably. So you have a much wider spectrum of fires when you go to in real life, where for instance, ventilation is going to work much better. But what yeah. you can't argue about is that if you go to fire in that type of residential, meaning those volume spaces and the fire is in that, um, um, that state that that would happen. And I think that that's one, if, if you argue against that, you have a, a big problem. But, but the, the second important question to that one is, can you safely identify from the outside or within just looking into the hallway in which state the fire is? Is it a it, it little bit early in the, in the stage or is it way later in the stage to make the decision to, to for instance, go for ventilation or are you just guessing and hoping it's not in the right stage? <laughs> and for the most part, we're guessing and hoping. Uh, I'd like to uh, give you a, an example of uh, not truly understanding uh, ventilation as being appropriate or not. Uh, you may recall that in uh, June of 2001, before September of 2001, June of 2001, the FDNY experienced uh, a fire where four, uh, uh, three firefighters were killed, and it was referred to as the Father's Day fire. It was a fire in the basement of a, a hardware store, a hardware store that sold uh, a lot of different uh, things, you know, uh, from uh, nuts, bolts, uh, tools, paint, uh, volatiles, <clears throat> acetone, lacquer thinners, things like that. Uh, many different things. Uh, the 4-9 Battalion, for which I was uh, assigned to the 4-9 Battalion, was uh, the first two incident commander. <clears throat> I was supposed to be working that day. I had uh, my uh, partner uh, working for me, and I was coming in to relieve him that night. I came in early. Uh, the change of shift is at 6 o'clock. I came in at 5. Uh, all the units were out. Um, and I learned that uh, they were at a fire where, uh, uh, let's say, a catastrophic event had happened. And I, I say it that way because I was uh, informed that messages were being transmitted from the scene uh, and they weren't uh, being transmitted so that uh, the public could hear them. So that's not a good sign. So I got over there early, if you will. 
And the event had, uh, the fire had come in around three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, the units pulled up. They brought a, a hand line into the store uh, right above the stairs leading to the basement. Uh, the chief was there as well. Uh, they were hearing all kinds of uh, explosions, meaning uh, like aerosol cans and things like that, uh, explosions down in the basement. And the fire uh, or the flames and colors of the flames downstairs were all different colors. In other words, it didn't look like a routine fire. And there was a report from the rear of the building that there was direct access to the basement from the rear of the building. Uh, so the chief then authorized, okay, uh, force that door back there and we'll allow another hand line to go in and directly uh, extinguish the fire right away. It was a, the door was very fortified in that it had three iron or steel uh, uh, beams, if you will, across the door. So it really delayed uh, forcible entry to the point where b really before they <laughs> made an opening large enough to where somebody could actually walk through with a hand line, uh, it didn't happen. <laughs> and I'll back up a little bit. As they were forcing that uh, door, they made an opening where you could have introduced uh, water into the space. And really what was happening was uh, there was an active fire from children that were in the back of the building, adolescents, that were playing with gasoline. They knocked over a gasoline can. Gasoline went under the door, and it was ignited by a hot water heater uh, with its pilot light. And that fire caused uh, storage of cans of, uh, let's say, acetone and lacatinus and things like that to boil over and pop their tops, which meant that now the atmosphere had fuel in it, but it was too rich to burn. Even though there was active flame, there was some smoke and, uh, let's say, these volatiles in the atmosphere, too rich to burn. And, of course, the rest of the firefighters on the fire ground were performing our operations. What I mean is they were breaking glass, basement windows, around the perimeter of the building. So, in essence, in my opinion and also uh, speaking with Peter McBride. Uh, I, I'm also going to interject right here that a after the event and after the fire, FDNY had reached out to uh, a PhD who studied, uh, and his forte was studying explosions and things like that, to uh, tell us what kind of an event just uh, transpired here. And his paper, his name is Zolosh. His paper uh, explained the phenomena to be a backdraft. Okay. Peter McBride and myself have a difference of opinion because there's a difference between a smoke explosion and a backdraft. Uh, one is, uh, uh, let's say, a, a deflagration, and one is not, meaning uh, it's faster than the speed of uh, sound. And a smoke explosion uh, ignites with much more pressure than a backdraft. And we are uh, of the opinion that this was a smoke explosion, meaning it was the fuel. Uh, by us not introducing water into that space and cooling those gases, you know, whether it was a straight stream or not, if water was introduced into that space, it would have been deflected and uh, droplets would have been made and it would have cooled some of the gases within the space so that it wasn't so volatile, but we didn't do that. And as we were venting around the perimeter of this building, uh, then yeah, Yes, we introduced oxygen, but we also uh, uh, allowed it to come to a point where it reached its explosive limits and it exploded with such intensity that it took out an entire wall of the building and two firefighters were crushed uh, in the debris of bricks and one firefighter was blown into the basement and uh, he died by running out of air because we couldn't get to him soon enough. Uh, so there, that would have been a fire that, again, had we been allowed to introduce water, even if it was a small space, you can get a, a stream of water in there. But the chief said, no, no, I want that door wide open so that you can move in. Nobody was thinking about changing the atmosphere. And, and while not putting water into the space and allowing other firefighters on the fire ground to vent the building, hmm, that precipitated the event, I would say. 
And I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not an uncommon event wherever you go in the world that firefighters taught or not taught are ventilating because usually it works fine. Yes. Usually, usually it's good. Yes. But there, but then do you ventilate in every fire? And again, you have that 5% or 1% or even the uh, thousands of a percent of fire when somebody gets killed because you're ventilating a fire that, 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 that you don't have control over. And that, that's, that is the problem because if, if you, if you recognize, if you recognize, or if you acknowledge that that is a possibility, if you acknowledge the possibility that we have, for instance, too rich to burn, to use the terminology environments, you have to recognize that you have to take two positions. You either continue to say that that's a, that's a, that's an unfortunate part of the job. Let's keep doing what we're doing. And, and let's just hope it's not my fire or it's not that very often. Or you have the option to say, well, I have to do something about it. But if you take the option to do something about it, it's pretty tricky because you have to l learn. You have to you have to teach your firefighters to identify which those fires are. And that is not an easy task because I cannot, even though I'm a nerd, and I watch YouTube videos all the time because that's one of the ways you can learn to anticipate what that fire is doing. Because if you mm -hmm. watch a thousand videos on YouTube, that gives you kind of a recognition recognition of fire behavior indicators and so on. And I would go like, I'm surprised all the time. Like you can have thick, hot, rolling black smoke coming out of a hallway, open door and door wide open. It can stay there for 10 minutes. Nothing happens. Like there's no violent reaction, there's no ignitions, there's no pressure increase. And you can go to a building and you see on videos, you go like, well, a little bit of white wispy smoke and boom, everybody explodes. <laughs> it's, and it's, so you, you get to the point where you go like, well, if I acknowledge that that is a possibility, I still going to struggle a lot with, with saying that how, we're gonna, how are we going to create uh, um, like a, how are we going to create uh, guidelines or whatever you want to call it for firefighters to use that information saying that well this is this is the five percent fire we can't ventilate just at all and that's why <laughs> most f like nerds <laughs> would would sign off on since this is very complicated you probably want to go all the way down to saying that if you don't have water in the fire don't ventilate and but that but that that is that is taking a that that is going like belt and suspenders like the, the 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 we're going all the way down to don't get water on the fire because five percent of the fire is just going to go horribly wrong well it was always <clears throat> uh suggested in the philosophy and fdmy was vertical ventilation always uh always good horizontal ventilation only only when they get water but i wanted to mention this i was always taught as a young firefighter and even in recruit school, uh, and I guess once I got into the field, I, if we were at the entrance door uh, to the fire area, if you will, uh, with water, ready to go, and we were going to open that door, the philosophy was, and the term used was, stay low and let it blow, which meant that you're going to open that door, get to the side, stay low, because this thing might light up and, and blow right over your head, so stay low, let it blow, and then move in on this thing. It wasn't like open a door and rush right in. Uh, so the stay low, let it blow philosophy was that they understood that there was going to be a reaction. Here. Uh, right. There was going to be an action. Uh, but it wasn't explained as to why. You know, what's happening? There was experience with the phenomena that, right. that no reasons for us. But the, but the, only, the, only, the only solution to that was just basically wait it out. Well, from not long, you know. No, but no, but yeah, but wait, no, but like if it happens, uh, well, if it started to light off, were you then allowed to use water? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so as soon as the smoke started igniting, you yeah. would you would start flowing water. Exactly. Okay, so so at least at least it wasn't like like blowing over your head. Was it because that that was also one of the things I've heard in the United States that some departments or some teachers teach their fire for like like don't put water on on fire either if you know that the fire the seat of the fire is fairly close because <laughs> yeah. as soon as you start as soon as if, if it lights off 
you kind of get visibility, you get light, you can crawl under that until you make that turn, now you put water on the fire, because if you start using water, in, out, like in the hallway, it turns okay. to, to a firefighter soup. Well, to me, how, how long is that? In other words, how far do I have to go in where I'm going to experience that? I wouldn't want to do that for 20, 25 feet. Uh, if we're only talking three or four feet, uh, okay, you know, crawl in and get to the room. Uh, so put it in context. Uh, yeah, but yeah. I, again, I've just mentioned something I heard, and I go like, well, that's a, that's a risky... I'm Big not time. saying it's not possible. I'm just saying that yeah. you would I have mean, to get in. and A hallway in the apartment is 20 feet down the hallway, and you have flames <laughs> coming down the ceiling. I mean, for some guys, hey, yeah, uh, let's do this. We'll crawl in and... Uh, but you have smoking gear and everything. Uh, just uh, Exactly, yeah. And, and, and I, I mean, dry heat is another one of the things that we, maybe we can touch more upon in steam a little bit more. But but dry heat is, of course, what, things we can handle very easily with our equipment. Granted, for a for a for a short period of time. Right. Like we, if you just did you feel you basically you, you can almost if you have a if you have a flame hot hot flames rolling over your head and the air trick coming in, you could you don't even have have to have an SCBA on because the air temperature down there. It's not very, very, very hot, and you got only got radiant heat. And if you put your brim down on your your helmet, so you're protected against the radiant heat, you can pretty much crawl in there without an SCBA. But as soon as you start putting water on that, you start having a higher temperature. You 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 will you will start mixing it, regardless of what stream you're using, smooth bore, straight stream, regardless of nozzle pattern, you're going to create more or less a firefighter soup. Yes. And now the the energy, the the the, the uh, the air temperature is going to get increased, and and also steam content, which which increases thermal, um, th awesome. thermal uh, transfer to your skin. So oh. now, not so fun anymore without an SCBA. Right. Well, even if you have an SCBA gear, eventually that heat will saturate your gear and start to get very uncomfortable. Mm. But it's like it's like it's. It's the risk all if it it's the risk you take, take to it. If it goes good, it goes very good. But if it goes bad, it goes horribly bad. Oh, and it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> Which I mean, for me, that's a, like a, that's I can't teach firefighters like well, I'll, I'll I'll hope it works. If it doesn't work, tough luck. Yeah. Like I, I can only teach like this is this is a calculated guess. This is how you judge between different outcomes. And if you want to take that ga the chance, sure. But you should understand the the options you have. You should understand the risk you're taking. For instance, like we talked a little bit about before, we talked about fear. If you're fearful, you don't you're not in control, and you never want to be not in control because. If you, if you don't understand the, 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 you don't understand the risk. If you understand the risk, you're probably not scared because you make a conscious decision. I'm going to value that risk. You're, you're, like, I, th I think it fear is a, it's a bad feeling. Oh, I agree. And, uh, you know, I've been there, uh, but always equated to thinking of, Okay, uh, my surroundings, uh, what's going on, uh, fire conditions, how far I'm going in, uh, do I have the tools with me, you know, the water that I could uh, protect myself, all of those things going through my mind uh, as the commit, how am I going to commit here yeah, against this fear? Because, uh, I mean, there's times where you, you move past that, meaning because you have the confidence that what you're doing and what you're uh <clears throat> decision you're making is okay uh, well i think i think, I think the, you, you you can do something that's dangerous but mm -hmm. if you know why it's dangerous and you know the outcomes that that reduces fear and anxiety right because the fear and anxiety are very emotions very collect uh, very uh centered on on uh, not being in control yeah and I, I tell you what if you have the lack of fear there's something wrong um, oh, oh, yeah. Well, I, I again, I would I def definitely. I would, but I've used the world. Uh, I would use not just another word. I would just use con risk conscious. Also, you know that you understand what that what you're doing is actually a risk, and you know you can't for somehow 
like you calculate that risk in your head like i this is this is a risk i'm willing to take for instance mm -hmm. um now this is, <laughs> let's, let's get away from that one because i really okay. want to talk to a reason for it. we talked about we talked about that uh ventilation practices so going back to the, we, the tag back to the, what that i think a lot of and i support that i teach that that if you can't teach the firefighters when ventilation is going to be bad you will you will uh, uh, retract back to if you don't have water on the fire don't ventilate and I, that's the message that fringes you will push us and i support that but you also have to acknowledge to all the people who's done ventilation or at fires and it was successful you have to also say that because understanding that most of the time ventilation works beautifully both both horizontal ppa and vertical it's just very hard to know exactly when it's go, going to go bad what we've enjoyed to say and what we got used to uh in fdny's uh history if you will and i'll, I'll say history 60s 70s 80s was that the the engine companies in other words the position of hose lines the fact that they were ready with water and the fact that uh, it, we'll use the word aggressive. In other words, we knew they were going to move in efficiently and <clears throat> they were going to move in on this fire, but they were going to also, these engine companies were going to move in and advance on a fire knowing that ventilation was going to be provided for them and things would get better for them as they were moving in. So in other words, it, it, it worked as a coordinated effort. And that's how we all became ingrained with uh okay ventilation is always going to be good you know but if it's done a little bit too soon that engine company is going to have a hell of a ride going through the fire but between you and me, a lot of them would hope for that you know <laughs> yes. to say, well, and, i went to work and uh, oh that was a mattress fire or it was a couch on fire i would say boy I, oven on fire so that I could go back to the firehouse and say <laughs> I put out four rooms of fire I didn't just put out a couch or a kitchen cabinet you know what I mean uh, oh yeah so and, yeah and, and, the challenge yeah and I, I I'm the first to say hey I love burning houses uh I don't burn other people's houses I usually <laughs> try to get a, a practice house but I mean it, it it is fun but going going back to that well we talked a little bit that before when we talk about like structural components like if you have a if you increase the energy production of the fire it will eat away on on fuel sources faster and if that fuel source is a rafter if a it's a beam it's an eye joist whatever it might be it will eat away those those beams exponentially fast like when you have that attic fire and you say, well, I don't care if the sky is burning. And you pop that hole, that smoke comes up, and it lights off. Like, from what I've been described, the trucker moment. <laughs> like, no. you pop that hole, it started lighting. And I go like, and, 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 go like I, and I don't care either. It doesn't really matter that the sky is burning. But, right. again, you're removing fuel from the attic, and the fuel is being replaced by oxygen coming in, and you increase combustion in the attic. And then con combustion in the attic eats away all the supporting elements. And you're releasing steam. So, so if the interior companies, if let's say the interior companies are pulling ceiling and they're getting a, let's say they do it as they should. They, they make a small hole, get a stream up there and whip it around. Uh, would, it would be mean better with a piercing nozzle. But let's say, let's just take the, the middle road. They whip it in stream around. They're basically suppressing fire wherever they can hit surfaces when they're creating steam. And the steam would suppress the fire even further away. But now we have a hole in the roof and every, all the steam just goes straight out. And we had discussed this in our last conversation as well. And, and I agree with you 100 percent. And I, I also believe that <clears throat> the fire service is not being uh, that concept is not being exposed to them because we even had discussions on, let's say, Houston uh, and some of their practices. And the fact that, that the Southwest Inn, as they were entering that space, nobody put a hook in the ceiling to see how much fire was above their head to understand the danger uh, of that lightweight construction and the fact that they were in a, a possibly a collapse situation. Yeah. And I agree with you 100%. Um, whereas now ventilation should also be discussed in that aspect, if you will. 
that increasing fire intensity is going to increase uh, the damage and compromise to the structural elements. So according to, let's say, the type of construction, uh, whether it be, you know, dimensional lumber versus lightweight yeah. construction, yeah. we have to consider that maybe ventilation should be limited. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can also... I think this was one of my first things I asked when I was a firefighter. There was, it was because I was, it was a couple of years ago, I was over in the United States. And there was a training fire in a training building. Uh, it, was a, it was a purpose-built training building. So it was like a wood, wood purpose built. And it was, they had a room and content fire with a you know, normal peaked attic. And they had a truck company going up and making a hole in the roof. But they just made a hole to the attic. And the attic, there wasn't any fire in the attic. It was a room and content fire. So they had to also punch a hole through to the room and content fire. And the question was, well, why would you want to have the fire go up into the attic, start burning the attic, and then up into the hole in the roof? And, and they go like, oh, that's how we do it. But I didn't understand because when they suppress the room and content fire, they have a raging attic fire, which burned down the whole house. Um, because they're trying to ventilate more and more and more. Exactly. And the more they ventilate, the more fire they get and they can't, they can't really get to it. Um, so, and I had a problem with that um, because that, that, that was not what I've been taught. Um, but even if you have, especially if you have a fire in the attic, I, I, I really don't understand why people want to do vertical ventilation, because it doesn't. It, it, it will increase the pressure. It will increase the, the 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 combustion rate in the attic and so on. It will not create. You don't need any lift in the attic, even if you would get lift. You don't need any lift in there. You don't need visibility. You don't need to reduce all the concentration of toxic gases. What you want to do is create as much steam as possible and keep it there. Yeah. And to maximize steam productions, you want to have you want to have low flow and high pressure, which we talked about all before, because you don't want to cool the surfaces down, because if you cool the surfaces down, they don't vaporize the steam. Right. The water doesn't vaporize the steam as, as efficiently. You want to you want to basically create a sauna of it. And, and that because I understand we can talk more about steam for victim survivability. It's an interesting topic. But for that, when you take away that, like the, the, nobody's living in a, in a, in a cock loft. Right. There's, there's no people there. If you take away that argument, they shouldn't be that complicated. Steam, it's impossible to burn if there's enough steam in there. Keep the steam there. And the, the fire might crawl. It might glow slowly. It might crawl somewhere. But if you steam it out, you have time to start finding it with a thermal imager, make small, small, small holes and get some water up in here, get some small holes up here, for instance, with a piercing nozzle. And you know what? It, I understand it. I agree with what uh, I was saying. Um, it's going to be a long time before, let's say, the fire service in North America grasp that especially with respect to uh, peak roof private dwellings and things like that but what i was just thinking you know we have apartment houses uh with cock lofts, if you will yeah and, and <clears throat> they're supposed to be limited in size to uh, uh 3, square feet uh, but uh, where i'm coming from is you know i've been at fires where once smoke and and, and that smoke can be hot enough uh, to ignite a cockwall fire for a, a fire that's not on the top floor. It could be on, let's say it's a five-story building, I have a fire on the third floor, and uh, smoke finds its way uh, through, uh, uh, you know, channel rails and things like that, or, uh, you know, just openings uh, going up to the cockwall, where I have a secondary fire because yeah. the smoke is hot, but nobody's up there to put water on it until I order somebody up there, uh, meaning bring a, a hand line up. So what a roof firefighter would do would feel vent pipes. You know, a, a vent pipe is uh, uh, to a drain line system. You know, you have a bathtub, kitchen, so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you have to have a, a vent, and that pipe usually pierces the roof. Uh, so meaning that pipe goes through the cock wall. A firefighter would touch that with his hand, an ungloved hand, and if it was hot to touch, that's indicative of I have fire in a cockle. 
Well, that, I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's so that's a, with that, they would notify the chief, and then he would start cutting a hole. And now, yeah, and that's where I start to have objections. Okay, but because because we I, don't I, want to have that hole. Okay, and, and I can see where you where you're coming from, and, and you know I agree with you. But what what I'm looking for, yeah. meaning and what I'm expecting, I guess, is if granted. Okay, you notified me. You told me where you are in position of the building. I'm going to order a hand line up to the apartment right below you because you gave me to, uh, a position location where you are. But by you cutting a hole in the roof right there, I'm expecting that whatever lateral fire extension would would be halted, would stop, and now travel towards that hole because the heat currents would bring it to that hole. So to me, it would reduce lateral, lateral extension of the fire by providing that vertical ventilation. Well, that, that, that makes a lot of sense, but you also have to consider that, that yes, everything, if it is a if it's common cock off, you would get, like you said, you would get a current going that way. So you would gather it there, but you, but you still also, what happens, that current has to come from somewhere. So there has to be oxygen coming in here and oxygen coming in here. So you're gonna have two fronts. You're gonna well. You're gonna have two. Uh, you probably will develop two points of, in that case, maybe three points of, of energy being dispersed. You have the one where the where this. Let's say it's hot smoke coming out of the hole. That's where you have the sky is burning. Doesn't really matter. It's it's okay. You can put, you can put water in through the hole also and pretty much negate that energy if that energy is a problem. But you also have a way over here, a way over here, where the auction comes in and starts meeting smoldering ambers and so on, you can start get mixing, you start to increase combustion. So you also increase combustion in the far end, so wherever that fire is progressing laterally. Okay. And that fire you can't reach. So what happens is, let's, let's just guessing here, what happens is you've got a fire here, and you start putting water in here, you start moving, and you start chasing that fire. You start working, you're going everywhere, and every you make a hole here. It seems to be over there. It seems to be over there. As so you make a hole over there and hole over there, and then you realize it's going even further and going even further, and you end up chasing that one. And if you're fast enough, you'll catch it. But if you don't fast enough, it will run away from you. Were you suggesting putting water in the very hole that you, uh, the vertical hole that you made? No, I wouldn't make a hole at all. <laughs> oh, I know. I but I mean, no, yeah. the introduction of water. Were you saying it was coming in from the very the vertical hole? No, I would put water in. I would put water in as far in. I would in that case. Let's let's say let's say what I wanted. What I would do. Let's say you find that hot hot vent point. What I right. would do is that I would try to identify structure, looking at the structure, but also if I have a tick and so on, can identify. But where do I think it is not gone? Like where okay. do I think the end points are? Like I if I identify like. Here, I think I don't think it can get through here because there's a, there's a barrier here, for instance, or whatever it might be. And I'll start from there with a piercing nozzle, and I'll make it into a porcupine where I start from where I don't think it is, and I'll work my way in with a piercing nozzle. And from my type of construction, where mostly, if you're talking about walls and everything, it's CC 60 centimeters, so like three feet. Yes. That would be, that would be, that would be, uh, two by fours or two by two by threes or whatever it might be at, at 60 centimeters. That would be like a standard measurement. We so, basically have the same thing. We yeah, have and I would put down the, in that case, I would put one hole every 60 centimeters to make sure that I get a quick burst of water in every compartment going all the way from the, from where I think it's not gone all the way back to where I, th I know it is. You might even be able to extend that 60 centimeters a little bit further. But in any event, uh, how I had mentioned that uh, this roof firefighter would transmit to the incident commander uh, basically a location in the building where yeah. he uh, is experiencing fire in a cock loft and or even without, uh, let's say, that hot vent pipe, it could be bubbles in the top, yeah. the top paper, you know. If that's bubbling. I got fire down there. But oh, you've got a, probably a, a lot of fire. <laughs> we would have an engine company, a line, and of course we would have a truck company next to them, meaning firefighters with hooks, yeah. opening that ceiling so that they could operate. Now today, FDNY has a nozzle. It's referred to as the cockloft nozzle. And it has basically two nozzles and it spins around. Yeah. So that it throws water 
you know, a great distance up into Akakwa, but I'm, <laughs> that's not at every fire, and nor is it readily available. So really, what the, these engine companies do is not only hit the uh, fire directly over their head, they try and deflect it into other areas and other directions. Whereas now, uh, let's say I'd have a, a, a firefighter with a hook go into the next room and give me a hole and see what you see, and then bring that line over there. And so we see, and then we'd have other firefighters go into adjoining apartments doing the same thing, put in, the, in an inspection hole. Yeah. Don't pull down the whole ceiling. Just give me an, an inspection hole and tell me if you see fuego. If you just see smoke, uh, uh, we expect that. But yeah. I want to know if you see fire. In other words, determine the outer uh, uh, extension and travel of this fire. It's not always yeah, and, and I think I, yeah, and I, and I, I think that I mean I have no problem with that one. I we talked about a little bit like the one of the problems with the, for instance with the, that kind of nozzle is that the, this this flows too much water. Um, <laughs> Ceilings can drop. Yeah, and well, it's and it's not just the water damages and ceiling drop. It's just that if you're if you're cooling it so fast, you don't produce steam. You're 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 basically having less effect with more water. Um, besides of all the problems like water damages and and, and so on. But again, going back to it, I think a lot of a lot of where we have where we have concealed fires, which is very common in Sweden, because Swedish construction is is not like like Southern Europe where there is. I mean, if I go down to Spain, they can't, they don't he, they've never heard about like concealed fires because all their houses are, like concrete. Okay. <laughs> uh, but we have we are very similar construction where everything is dimensional lumber or lightweight construction. Uh, maybe not to the extreme that United States have in lightweight, but it's still like everything is there's void spaces everywhere. Like old houses, two hundred year old houses, like it built on and built on and redone and built on. The walls could be this with like different types of materials built on each other, and you get all these cavities everywhere. But we, you do, and we, from the outside, you, you just know there's smoke coming or you see f f heat in the thermal imager and. Again, if you start opening that up, you're 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 chasing that fire, and every time you make a hole, you're letting oxygen in and, and smoke coming out, and you have a bigger fire somewhere. It doesn't have to be in the hole because if the hole is pretty easy, you can just extinguish the hole. But the oxygen goes all the way up into the cockloft, or up there, or up there, or up there. So in that case, it would be a a, cha a, a game of let's make it into a porcupine where. where well, the hedge was a porcupine. I mean, it's not the word. word. The porcupine yeah. is the one with all the. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you you make it into the oldest mahold everywhere because you 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 need, you basically need. A couple of deciliters of water. I mean, we're talking pints. I don't know what's what's a gallon is a small part of a gallon. You need a small part of a gallon to be sprayed out into that cavity, and it's done. The problem is that if you you need to go. 30 centimeters or a feet or two feet aside because that cavity is in no contact with this cavity by air, but water can't turn. It can't go through insulation and cracks and everything. So you have to really make holes everywhere and a little bit of water in each. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a really big problem because firefighters and officers are standing there and go like, I want to have control and to get control, so I want to see it. But the problem is, and if you, if you have a... <laughs> I used to say like this, if you open up a wall and you say you see fire, the second question is, was there fire before you opened the hole? In other words, do I, was it burnt already? No, it, no in other words, was it, was it just hot smoke? And basically you caught, you, you created that fire you saw by opening the hole. And so, so if you don't, if you don't open it up, it's just a. If you, if it's not very much like burned through and so on, it's just it's just smoke in there. Well, for us, there are about opening a ceiling into the cockloft. I usually have a hole in the roof already, so if I see fuego, <laughs> it's getting oxygen from the hole that's already there. You oh yeah, and that that might be true. Like if you have big large openings so where you burn that through, roof is not cut, and the inspection hole I give it, that's the oxygen. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's happened to us, uh, by the way. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a for instance. And uh, the partner that I'm writing uh, this high rise book with, uh, Jim, Jim Murtaugh, uh, was a chief at a fire that uh, the structure was an H type building, meaning H, when you look at it from the sky, it looks like the letter H. 
Uh, and one wing, uh, the wing to the left is a wing. Then it has a connection in between. We refer to that as a throat. And we had firefighters coming up in the B wing going to the top floor. And that cock loft over there was laden with thick smoke because of the fire in the A wing. And a firefighter, as soon as he entered an apartment, he put a hole in the ceiling. He saw smoke. He went deeper into the apartment. He put an, another hole in the ceiling near the outer wall. And when he put that hole in the ceiling, there was a cock loft explosion. In other words, it was a smoke explosion. And fire came raining down on him. Yeah. Uh, and he wrote an article about it in uh, uh, FDNY's magazine, WNYF. WNYF stands for With New York Firefighters. And his uh, the title of the article was Fires Changing Signals. In other words, he was now exposing us to a, a phenomena that uh, we have to be cautious of. Uh, you know, we're basically adding oxygen to a space that's not on fire. But it's late yeah. in the pool. And that was one, one I, there was a similar ac re accident in Sweden. There was a... Uh... It was a concealed, uh, like the false, false ceiling, the plates, the false insulation shaft, insulation ceiling you do on spaces to make it look good. You hide everything up up there with cables and drums. Um, and basically it was the same. There, there was a fire, the smoke spread up in there and the firefighters went in and, uh, and uh, I don't know if they exactly, if they actually punched holes or if it exploded that, but it was a, there was a, there was a fire gas explosion up in that fuss but then and the firefighters got really badly hurt um and, and i mean that's the it's it's, it's not a, it's not a common scenario but it does happen but what does happen in every fire almost in sweden is again those those almost regardless of what fire does if it's if it's a big fire you will have lots and lots of, of fire extending out in the wall cavities and everything so it's a very typical scenario and and it's a mess to get uh incident commanders and firefighters to not open it up and checking it and ba basically treating it with water before you open it up interesting uh but that is still a work in progress in sweden i would say because we had we st we had the same still have like i had a big uh, argument i i just folded because i didn't have the energy to drive it through but big army because we had new rules for chainsaws in sweden we had to take uh, like chainsaws has been in every fire truck to you to, to cut holes in roof and whatever and walls and it was a new rule for chainsaws that you had to have a lot more education to be able to use them because of the inherent risks of using chainsaws so um there was a lot of work done to give firefighters like a two day, three day class on chainsaws. It was a lot of work and th that was compressed for the fire service of so two, three days. And that, that's a lot of training hours for a firefighter yeah. to go through just for, for a chainsaw. And now I was making a case that basically for, 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 for structure fires, any situation where you think that you have to have a use a chainsaw to be fast, it's a situation that you shouldn't use a chainsaw because you shouldn't open it up any case, anyhow, because you should treat it with water before you do it. Any case that's not important, not important, not urgent, you can instead do the same job with a saw saw, like a reciprocating saw, which is much slower, but it's much safer. And you don't need two, three days of training. And I was making a big push for that. I was not successful. So we still have the chainsaws on the barb and I was on every truck. Well, I'm certainly. But I'm still, I'm you. still fighting for that position. I'm in agreement with you uh, to treat spaces with water first, if possible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just like the Father's Day fire, had we introduced water into that space first, it would have changed conditions. Um, now it's a different matter. We could talk about victim survivability. So, so what were you, what were you taught? Going back to like early days, what were you talk about introducing water into spaces where there might be victims inside? Do not operate a line into a, a window of an occupied building. Was there any one any talk about operating a line from one compartment into the next one when you were inside? No. Uh, we were taught to be aware that we could push fire uh let's yeah. say 
if we were going down a hallway and we were operating a line into one room and uh, it was interconnected with another room, a uh, fire could be pushed around, uh, wrap around. Uh, and high-rise buildings, uh, a good body of fire, we were also uh, taught to be aware that by operating hose lines, uh, fire could wrap around the core uh, and come around behind us type thing. Um, you know, and that's why they came up with uh, tactics referred to as uh, flanking and or pincer, a pincer attack. Uh, but, you know, I'd like to learn, study more about that because, quite frankly, I'm operating a hose line. Uh, and if I'm negating its vent point towards me, it's going to be high pressure to low pressure. It's going to want to go somewhere else. And uh, what's allowing it to go somewhere else? Um, you know, I mean, in high-rise buildings, the only places that are low pressure compared to high pressure are other vertical shafts, elevator shafts, stairwells. Uh, <laughs> again. It's, I mean, it's really, it might, sometimes it might be easy, easy in theory, but, but it's in practice is really hard because you can't see, you can't judge, you don't know where the outlets and inlets are, you don't know where the high pressure is. So, so that's why it's, it's easy to say that, let's say it was true, and it sort of is true, but let's say it, if you negate a, a vent point from the outside to the window, let's say you whip that stream around so that it blocks that outlet. You mm -hmm. change basically that that becomes from an outlet or be a bi-directionally outlet inlet that goes into an inlet or you do it with a fog for instance that's pretty easy because you can see it you can see it from the outside you see exactly what's happening maybe you're out in the hallway on the inside you can see it there but if you do the same thing from the inside when you have no visibility and you're moving let's say you're moving into a compartment and that it has a doorway into another compartment as soon as you start using that stream in that other compart doorway you're doing the exact same thing but you don't know where you're pushing it like so if you if you were to if you were to acknowledge the if you were if you let's say you say well you're never going to put a stream through an open window but you because you let's say you go all the way to to that position you're never going to put a stream through that window because you don't know where you're pushing it right. you could never go inside and say i'm never going to put a stream through any opening inside a space either because i don't know where i'm pushing it that's right it's basically the same thing it's the same thing the only reason you're doing it from the inside is that because you don't know where you're pushing it yes <clears throat> and i mean we've always advocated you know uh, interior firefighting enter the building through the front door and for the most part if it was an apartment house tenement uh, type dwelling <clears throat> which is a multiple dwelling we're coming in the front door because that places us in a position where we're protecting the interior stairs and usually the interior stairs was singular their secondary means of egress was usually a fire escape or something like that yeah so it was always we're protecting the primary means of egress for people above the fire coming into a private dwelling we're coming in the front door. We're protecting it. There's uh, stairs leading up to the uh, upper floors. We're protecting that so that fire doesn't extend up there. And or coming in the front door, if it was a single uh, story building, we're at the main portion of uh, uh, the dwelling, if you will, between the bedrooms and the kitchen and the living room. And for the most part, many fires start in the kitchen, so we're keeping that fire from extending to the bedroom. In other words, there was always like a concept of why we're planting ourselves here. Why is it always an interior attack? Why is it always the front door? Uh, and I think there's a lot of value to that. I don't think that was a bad decision. No, none, the only the, the where I think it went over the the top is where you go like, well, I have to position myself there. So I'll, I'll, I'll do, I'll stretch a host line to wherever it might take me and then go inside and I'll go to that position. Even it's going to take me five minutes, but the actual, then, then by doing so you're letting the fire burn for five minutes, which you could have knocked down the first 30 seconds when you arrived on scene. If, if the, if the, if it was coming out of the window, I agree. And that's what, that's where you go. Like. Well, it wasn't. I I don't. I acknowledge that you you could you could. I think that's a good position to be. We should protect the staircase. We should protect the central escape routes and so on. And that's where, 
where, for instance, if you talk high rises, so the smoke blocker and so on are essential tools for for doing that practically to protect those those means of of escape. But again, taking it too far, like like everything's done. If you only think that straight streams is the answer, if you, answer if you only think that fog is the answer for interior attack, if you take things things too far, they tend to be dogmatic. And when we turn dogmatic, it turns to be stupid. Well, you have no flexibility. You don't have a flexibility. Now, no. flexibility adds complexity. So there's, so, so there's the, I mean, if you take flexibility too far, you, 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 if you go full flexibility, you go to Sweden, where we've taught, we've taught fire behavior to firefighters so that every fire, fire, uh, fire understands that auction to the fire is bad and so on but we didn't t teach enough firefighting behavior so we didn't teach a lot of fires fighters how to behave according to that information and this is my solution which so we adopted some crazy things about our behavior because there was a disconnect between the information we provided and the behavior and, and if, I, if I'm going black and white and simplifying, I would say it's the opposite for America. We teach a lot about behavior, but not anything about why you should have that behavior. And you get a problem also of adapting towards whatever flexibility you need. So mm -hmm. there is, again, I would say Sweden went w way too far from that direction. And we need to rein back and talk about guidelines and so on, saying that in this situation, we think that this behavior is, is, is the most appropriate one. But give enough information for the people to make their own decision that this is not applicable right now. And just as well as the United States probably should some of the guidelines that have been created, like the, which have turned into like rules, like never apply water from the outside. Always do from the unburned to the burnt side. And go like, yes, that might be a good guideline, but it's not always. Right. And that's words we tend not to use. And to tell you the truth, and I've, I've been involved in writing up uh, procedural documents. And uh, we try to, we like to use the word guidelines. Yeah. And, and why I'm throwing that out there is that, uh, look what's going on with Grenfell uh, and the, uh, uh, the court case, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, and the opening arguments uh, in the Grenfell case, whereas it appears that they're trying to, one, uh, blame or or show uh, inadequacy of the London Fire Brigade at that far when in fact they did an outstanding job and they were just dealt with uh, fire extending in on every floor uh, whatever smoke control systems they had in uh, the lobbies on each floor were uh, uh, in a uh, <clears throat> and smoke contaminated the one and only stairwell in the bed in other words when you write up a procedural document, it can't be carved in stone because you may have to defend it in court, uh, whereas somebody's going to say, well, you it says right here, you were supposed yeah. to. Okay, so it's a guideline. And then from there, you like to stay away from words like always and never. Uh, because the situations and fire conditions, I, a lot of people may say, oh, a lot of fires are alike. No, every fire is different. Uh, because the circumstances are different. Uh, the vent points, uh, the fuel package, uh, the geometry of fuels. You had even mentioned, you know, a couch uh, burning in the corner of a room. Yeah, well, in the corner of a room, you're going to get radiation feedback, so you're going to get high heat release rate. So no fire is alike, unless, of course, it's like NIST, and we set it up where the fuel package is the same. Because we want we want the data, the baseline data, to be the same. Now we're going to give it different. Uh, uh, conditions we will control the vent uh, or how much oxygen it gets so on and so forth uh, yeah my two cents on always and never oh, but it is I mean there's, there's always the downside so if you have that on you because I agree with everything you said it's and then the, the, the Grenfell case is just a, such a obvious case so people being the firefighters and the officer there being uh, it felt like when I'm listening to the interviews that being basically um, run through the mill of saying, why didn't you follow procedure to, to, to the letter? Um, and that, I mean, and it might even be 
regardless of the procedures are, are sound or not. Like right. you should follow procedure regardless. It felt like that when they, but, but, but during the hearing. But I'm not surprised about that because the, the people who's doing the hearing doesn't have any firefighter education. So they just go so, like, it says you should do this, but you didn't do this. Why didn't you do this? So and it's pretty, like you said, it's it's you have that and write a procedure that works at every fire is like almost impossible. It, it is impossible. I hate but, to think but it's all but, end of that too, uh, because they're trying to protect those uh, in the UK. Politicians get involved in, let's say, the approval of certain uh, materials and things like that. We're talking about yeah. the cleaning, uh, whereas the fire service had very little uh, to say. And approval in, with respect to the types of cladding that went up on mm. that building. Um, it's just oh, there for the Grenfell is, is oh, it's a. Uh, it's going to ch the Grenfell inquiry is going to change the UK fire service and it's going to heavily impact, I think, fire service around the world. Yes. On many different ways. I hope so. Uh, and I, I hope so for for good in the end. Yes. Um, and I think so. But there's always the possibility of the fire service turning into more of a muscle. Like the, you just you just shut down and, and 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 try to protect yourself. Not like you reduce transparency. You you start you you all the things that you know happens all the time, like when people protecting each other. Because the UK uh, and London Fire Brigade, they themselves, they've stepped out of their cave. Oh, and, they're super oh, transparent. I'm very they've, surprised. Uh, established relationships with the uh, departments that come to New York City. New York City has uh, come to the to their uh, department as well. They've allowed us to come in. Um, John Cirillo and uh, George Healy went to the to the building. In other words. I believe that the London Fire Brigade is going to receive support from international uh, support uh, from the fire service in their favor. And I think it's going to be an eye opener to building owners, managers, politicians and things like that. And um, the manufacturers of these materials is that we're not going to stand by and let this happen to us again. You know, like what happened. Uh, World War II. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. at least I hope so. I hope so too. Yeah, the world the, is in, in that theory. It's money talks, and unless yes. someone, mm -hmm. unless someone, finds the incentives and punishments for for how you build constructions, yes, uh, it's never gonna. It's not gonna happen anymore. I mean, like just like Sweden. Sweden has a very high sense of like worker security and everything, but Sweden is very poor in some regards. Very poor standards for fire. And the fire service doesn't matter what the fire service says because the somewhat engineer makes a cost benefit analysis and say the likelihood of a fire is so low, is yep. so low that the it's cost of it. the cost of implementing this for every fire you're gonna build is not worth it. Oh, and that's been a philosophy for many years uh, yeah. on the planet, not just Sweden. Like right. like you we have knew for many years there was a talk about having automatic doors uh, automatic door closers on uh, for uh, multifamily residential homes so that so that if you leave if you if you leave your your, your apartment yes. and there's a fire in your apartment they would close behind you and so on yes New York City and has to protect the expect uh, and, and those like that that was a cost benefit analysis that those those small gas <laughs> struts that you put on the doors those were too expensive to put there in comparison to what the cost would be to not do it. Yeah, percentages. Meaning. Yeah, percentages. It's just it, there's not enough fire. Fire is not a big problem in in the overall scheme of team, especially like Sweden has a housing shortage. Like there's not enough people are basically it's not there's not enough houses. There's not enough places to to stay, especially for if you're not rich. If you're rich, you always have a place to stay, but if you're not if you're not in the in the top third seventy percent. If you're like, if you don't, if you're in a, a low income, it's very hard to find a, a place to stay. Mm. Um, uh, so, so that's why politicians are. Well, I mean, they're caught between uh, two bad places. Either people don't have any place to, to live, or 
or, or, or because it's too expensive to build or we allow more fires but <laughs> at least most people have somewhere to stay mm. so i don't say it's an easy problem either but going back to the, the, the we talked about for for for, for granfeld uh start with with, with uh, uh oh where where did we jump in from granfeld well, we we're talking about policies and procedures and always yes, and the policy guide. procedures, the guidelines and the, like making those. It's but it is hard. I, I mean, I've, I've battled this all the time. What what do you write like like for UL? What do you write as a as a tactical consideration, for instance? Like exactly. that, that, that would be like a that would be like a guideline. <laughs> Isn't that a word that uh, in yeah. itself means a lot? It's a consideration. Yeah. But so, I mean, and it is and it, we'll have it's a problem with that. <laughs> yeah, but it, it is a soft word. I mean, the, the, there is a lot of flexibility of behind that word, and it, and if that's because, and you all are really well aware of it, and it's a, it is because, like like you said, all the fires we've done in those residential houses, they've been, when you start ventilate, everything becomes worse. Okay, so that's their conclusion from all the murders, the fires they made, but they also know that that's just one. Again, they take they take uh, the same fuel load. They they kind of let the fire burn to the same stage every time, and then they make openings. But in reality, you get there sooner, or you get there later, and if you get sooner or later, it might be fully okay to just ventilate, and everything gets better. And what are your resources? <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. FDNY the first. Uh, Hackerberry, Arizona. I mean, uh, five people are showing up, or twenty-five people are showing up. Uh, hmm. wh what do you accept uh, with respect to a vent it, let it light off? I got two hand lines here. Who cares? Boom! I'll have it out in five minutes. <laughs> so I mean, it's just all of those things. If you don't have the resources to to do that, absolutely, I like the idea of you know introducing water, fog nails, uh, water through a basement window for a basement fire whether whether the building is occupied or not we had a firefighter trapped on a half landing uh for a basement fire that they had difficulty um rescuing him because he was hung up he was unconscious and yet uh the, nobody allowed anybody to introduce water through a basement window and it would have been like flanking the fire it wouldn't wouldn't have been pushing the fire and it would have changed the heat release rates coming off uh, to affect the rescue, maybe uh, in a more expedited fashion. So I mean, and, and nobody's looking at that to say, "Oh, wow," you know. I've well, never heard. So, like, firefighting practices are very different around the world. And some places, for instance, steam and so on, it's a bit. This is considered like a major problem, like in the United States. In Sweden, is like a non-issue almost. Hmm? Um, truth is probably somewhere in the middle, like always. But, but. If you take that, it, like I, you, you can find it. You go like, how many firefighters around the world have been steamed to death? Like you, you, you can't find one. How many firefighters have been, like, been really uncomfortable with steam? Well, like everyone. Mm -hmm. Like, like, where's the line? Like, there's this. Then you can say, then, then you have your firefighters claiming, well, I've been steam burned. Like well, that's probably you can get us. You get you get you get blisters. Absolutely, probably, probably, maybe not because of steam, but at, but 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 uh, reinforced by steam. I mean that if it was it were, were dry heat only, they would be probably uncomfortable. But if it was steam also, they would be much much worse. But again, you go like because in the United States. Uh, firefighters are sometimes more afraid of steam than fire, which is a very strange uh, outcome. That, for instance, if you have a situation where somebody is firefighter screaming like I'm burning to death in here, and then 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 commander on the outside says, "Don't flow water, don't flow water, don't flow water," and that happens. And you read case studies that that happened, and you go like, "Well, they're more afraid of steaming someone, which is going to be really uncomfortable." But if you hit it in the right place, you're going to kill that energy being produced. And if you keep flowing water, you would get to the point where where, where, where um, Lloyd Lehman and so on start talking about. You're condensing the steam, which is actually invisible, back to water droplets. 
And when that conversion happened, it's just hot water now. And hot water is not penetrating your, your, your gear unless you start soaking it. But if it continues to cool, that's going to turn into cold water. Right. Like if you massively cool, that's going to turn into condensed water down to handable water. Right. And it's not a lot of energy inside that space. Like if, you, if you're inside a space, the volume, the ass volume inside a space is very, very easy to cool down. Like yeah. the amount of energy you have to absorb is not very much. Now the, the surfaces are different. Surfaces are much, can be much harder to cool down because there's a lot more mass to cool. But, it, but, but to get to the point where you say that, well, I'm going to be more afraid of steam than I am fire, you, you, that's going way too far. Yeah, that's not, uh, I don't have, that's not a problem with me, meaning I'm not afraid of steam. Uh, not at all. Um, I, think, I think that, like always, you should be, that's one, just one more thing that you have to consider. Yeah, I agree. Like I've learned a lot when I, you know, I start looking at the Iowa State video, and then they talked about the steam blanket and the, the condensing of steam and when or when not. But because they were talking about when the steam blanket starts to lift, you would get spot fires reappearing. Like they talk about all those concepts. You should watch it again. It's like yeah. the, the, the thing. It, you, and you watch the wording, and they talk about the indirect attack and indirect effect and everything. It's really interesting. Is it available on YouTube? Yeah, it's on YouTube. I can send it to you also. It, it is. It is. Uh, it is. It's fascinating because it explains a lot. And also about like flow. I'm gonna ask you talk. to send it. Yeah, I'll send it to you. Uh, I'm also and, gonna and, ask you to steal away here in about five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I need to go too. My my kid is coming back home.